Colossians chapter 1, if you will. We finished Philippians, we're going to Colossians, all right? So what I want to do is just give you an overview of the book of Colossians. And to do that, I want to introduce it by talking about the fact that it was part of a tri-city area. You know, we have a tri-city area in New York State. The, the capital district is actually a tri-city area. It's Albany and Troy and Schenectady. I don't know if you knew that. But Colossae was part of a tri-city commercial district, which included Colossae, Laodicea, that that uh, city na uh, name ring a bell? And then also one that perhaps isn't uh, as uh, popular, but yet it's in the Bible, Hierapolis. Hierapolis. Those three cities were a main commercial district, but at the time that Paul wrote this uh, letter to the Colossae <laughs> church, that commercial district of uh, Colossae was beginning to diminish. What's interesting about this is that Paul never made a visit to Colossae. He wrote to them, but there's no record of him being there. In fact, he says things like, look at verse 4 in, in chapter 1. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ, not that we've seen it. In fact, in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says this, uh, I have great conflict for you and for them in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So from those verses, we get the impression that Paul never set foot in Colossae. By the way, I had the privilege uh, quite a few years ago of uh, making a trip to Turkey and traveling to the seven ancient churches, the sites of the seven ancient churches uh, that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Along with that, I got to other places like Corinth and Ephesus and uh, Hierapolis and Laodicea and, uh, and Colossae. Uh, what was interesting to me about Colossae is that all the other sites had been excavated. There has not been any excavation whatsoever done at Colossae. It's just a heap uh, with, a, with a marker. That's it. And uh, so uh, I don't understand why. Perhaps it's money, you know, and time. But uh, anyway, these three churches, these three places had churches. Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. They had churches. And I think that they are the result of what God did there in the city of Ephesus. Listen to this. I'm reading from Acts 19. Paul continued with, of course, his mission uh, partners. He continued by the space of two years so that all which dwelt in Asia, that is, in that vicinity of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. What happened is that when Paul planted that church in the city of Ephesus, which was about 100 miles from this tri-city area of Hierapolis, Colossae, and um, Laodicea, the church at Ephesus sent out evangelists all over that vicinity and I think that that is the way that the church at Colossae actually began, and Laodicea and Hierapolis. There are two people in particular that were saved as a result of uh, Ephesus' evangelistic uh, push, and they are mentioned in the book of Colossae. The first one is a man by the name of Epaphras. We met him in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2 and chapter 4 of Philippians, there's a guy with a big name, Epaphroditus, same guy, Epaphras here in the book of Colossians. And then there's another man that Paul wrote the most personal letter in the whole New Testament to, and this man's name was Philemon. These two people, Epaphras was probably one of the key founders of the church in Colossae, and Philemon we are told in that little letter that Paul wrote to him, Philemon, 
housed the church at Colossae. It met in his home. And he had a wife, Aphia, and he had a son, Archippus. And it looks as if Archippus, the son of Philemon, is the pastor of the church there in Colossae. For example, uh, in chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul, in his closing, says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. And so that's a little bit of the background of this church in Colossae, how it got started. It actually, when Paul wrote this letter to them, he was, again, a prisoner in Rome, his first imprisonment in Rome. And while he was there, Epaphras came because he needed help, because there was some new teaching that was being introduced into the church there in Colossae, and it was having negative effects, causing problems. At the same time, while Paul was a prisoner, Epaphras not only came to Rome, but a slave ran away from Paul's friend Philemon. The slave's name was Onesimus, and uh, he connected with Paul when Paul was under house arrest there in Rome, and as a result, Paul led him to the Lord. He got, Onesimus got saved, and uh, he said, look, you need to go back to Philemon, your master. And he wrote this letter uh, to Philemon, and it was taken back to Philemon by Onesimus, and the letter to Colossae was taken back by Onesimus and another man who's mentioned in this book, Tychicus, He's also mentioned as part of Paul's mission team in Acts chapter 20. So this is what's going on here in this book. Why did Paul write the book of Colossians? Mainly because, as I said, Epaphras brought to his attention that there was some false teaching that was being introduced into the congregation. One of the main jobs of a pastor as a shepherd, is to keep the wolves out and to keep the false teaching out of out of uh, circulation in a local church. And so Epaphras was very much involved in the church at, at Colossae. So he brings this information about this heresy. The heresy that uh, was being spread that was very popular in that first century time period was a mixture. It was a syncretism of, uh, of Greek philosophy and, uh, and uh, Jewish legalism, as well as just uh, some of the Oriental mysticism, all of that mixed into what was called in that day Gnosticism. Now, I don't know if you ever heard that word Gnostic. It, it comes from the Greek word that is translated in our Bible to know. And so... The Gnostics were people that considered themselves as being in the know. They considered themselves as having a superior spirituality because they feel like they had an inside track to the truth that other believers didn't. And they taught heresy. And one of the heresies that uh, was significant among the Gnostics, they taught that all matter was evil. In other words, the human body was evil. Uh, all creation was evil because it was tainted by sin. So the body was evil. And that because God's holy, he could have no contact whatsoever with anything evil, with matter, with human beings. He, he couldn't have anything to do with them. And so... The Gnostics proposed a series of powerful spirit beings that emanated from God uh, to deal with his creation so God didn't have to get his hands dirty, so to speak. So God wouldn't have to come in contact with creation. And so since they taught that matter was evil, thus the body was considered evil, and one way to control the body these Gnostics came up with was by rigid discipline of yourself, uh, uh, asceticism, where you, you uh, by self-will, you denied yourself certain uh, things. 
And of course, we know what that kind of living does. It really complicates the problem because whenever you set out to do something by sheer human will, you end up compounding the problem. Uh, you not only find out you're defeated, but it, it stirs up things. It's like, you know, I, I say something and then I tell you, don't think about that. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you try by your own human will to not sin. And so this was a big problem in the church. It was a prison epistle. Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, and uh, can't think of another one, were all part of the prison epistles that Paul wrote in his first prison uh, imprisonment in Rome. Written about the same time in the early 60s, uh, while Paul was under house arrest. Another thing I want to point out by way of introduction before we actually do an overview of the four chapters here this morning, and that is this. If you are a Bible reader and you've read the book of Ephesians and then you've read the book of Colossians, you find a lot of similarities between the two, don't you? They're similar in their context and they're similar in their structure. But there is a main difference that I want to point out, and I think this will help us in our understanding of the book of Colossians. In Ephesians, we are introduced to what the Bible calls a mystery, which is some truth that is previously unknown that God reveals to his people. In Ephesians, that previously unknown truth is that God intends the unity of both Jew and Gentile who become one because they are joined in one spirit to the body of Christ. And so the leading truth in Ephesians is this emphasis, you're in Christ. And you'll find that little phrase, in Christ, in Christ, over and over. You're in Christ. If you're a believer, you're in Christ. That's the truth of the book of Philippians. However, Colossians that we're looking at beginning this morning reveals another mystery or another new previously unknown truth. And it is purposely given because it totally blows up the falsehood that all that is matter is evil. It blows that apart. Because what Colossians teaches us is not only that Christ is with you, but Christ is in you, that is, in your physical human body. And so the body can't be evil because Christ is in you. See? He has personal contact in you. He indwells in you. Well, that's where we want to begin this morning. And I want to see, I want you to see as we begin just how important it is that we find out who this Christ in you really is. And that's where we'll begin after we pray. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this scripture. I want to thank you for this little letter of Colossians. We need the truth that is here. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want you to just speak it to our hearts. Help us not to wander in our thinking, be distracted by things going on around us or things that uh, we would uh, be distracted in our thought life from. Lord, keep us focused. We thank you for the victory that we have in Christ. We thank you, as we've already said, that he is in us. And as a result, he is our victory. And he is the one that defeated all the powers of darkness. And so we stand in him at this moment and depend upon him and the spirit of God to work through this time that we have together, that as we've read this morning already, that in all things, Jesus might have the preeminence. We pray that for his glory. Amen. So let's look in chapter one. What I see is identification. By that, I mean, I think that verses 13 to 20 of chapter one 
are one of the most definitive New Testament passages on the person and work of Jesus Christ that we have anywhere else in the Scripture. In fact, I would say it probably is the counterpart to Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verses 6 through 11, where we get a glimpse of the humanity of Jesus. It's called, remember, the kenosis. He emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. The emphasis in 6 to 8 of Philippians 2 is the humanity of Jesus. The emphasis here in 13 to 20 of Colossians 1 is the deity of Jesus, his godhood. First of all, he seemed to be our Savior. Pick it up with me in verse 13 and verse 14, where we read, Jesus has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Drop down to verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, that's a code phrase to identify non-Jewish people, those that were alienated from God. He hath reconciled, verse 22, in the body of his flesh. Wow, in his body? The human body is an evil. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. So the first identification of Jesus that I want you to see is that he's the Savior. He's the Savior who came and lived in a perfect sinless human body, and his human blood, it was shed, and as a result, he was able to rescue human beings that trust him. He translates them, he rescues them from a dark kingdom and puts them in a dear kingdom. Which kingdom are you in this morning? Are you in the dark kingdom or are you in the dear kingdom? the kingdom of his dear son. And he does that by buying forgiveness for us and buying freedom for us, not for Jews only, but also for the nations. Whenever you see the word Gentiles, think nations, okay? Not just non-Jews, but think the nations. And this is what God's plan of redemption is. He's using Israel, that was his plan, and Israel's Messiah to bring the nations back to him. And it all started to really happen at the cross and then at uh, the tower, uh, uh, rather at, uh, uh, at Pentecost when the Tower of Babel was reversed. That's what he is. He's the Savior. Second thing he is, and this is vitally important. This is good stuff. When you get down to verse 15, uh, down to verse 20, He's not only the Savior, but as we make identification of Messiah Jesus, he is the sovereign. He's the sovereign one. What we read here is that he is eternal, and he is supreme over all, over creation. He is the creator, and he is the sustainer of not only the seen world, but even the unseen world. Look with me, verse 15. Jesus, the Messiah, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of every creature. For, listen to this, that Jesus is pictured here as the creator. This takes us back to Genesis 1. For by him were all things created that are in heaven that are in earth, look at, that are visible, seen, that are invisible, unseen. There is a total invisible realm, an unseen world that uh, we can't see with our physical eyes, but we know it's real. <laughs> he created that too. And the Bible says in that invisible realm, that unseen realm, there are thrones and dominions. There are principalities and powers, but all of those were created by him and for him. Notice that. Not only did he create them himself, but he created them for himself. 
Have you ever thought about yourself as created just for Jesus? That Jesus created you just for himself, which means not only that you're special, but you have real purpose in life. He created you for himself. It doesn't matter what other people say about you. It doesn't matter what uh, what other people call you. Jesus created you, and he created you for himself. And if you don't have a close connection with him, you're missing out on your purpose in life. He created you for himself. Isn't that wonderful, God? Jesus wants a personal, intimate relationship with you. He created you just for himself. You as an individual. He's the sovereign one. And he is death's conqueror. Look at this. Um, it says that uh, in verse 18, he's the head of the body, which is the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He conquered death. And because he conquered death, guess what? His people will conquer death also. Because he lives, we shall live also. That in all things, all means all, he might have the preeminence, that first place. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That is, all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus in a human body. And so, do you get it? Messiah Jesus is the eternal God. He is supreme over all. He is God's fullness in a human body. Jesus is. And he reconciled creation to himself through his sacrificial death in that perfect, sinless human body and that sinless blood. That's what, uh, again, verse 21 and 22 are about. So let's identify who Jesus is because this is important. He is God in the human body, and as such, he's our Savior, but he's also the sovereign. There's a third thing, and I want you to drop down to verse 24 with me. And, and Paul says that he now rejoices in his sufferings for the Colossian people. How's he suffering? Well, he's in prison. He's in prison for being a gospel preacher, and so he's suffering uh, for them and other believers because it's through his preaching that they heard the gospel. But he's suffering because of it. He's in prison. But it's okay, he said, because all I'm doing is I'm filling up what was left behind of the afflictions of Jesus in my flesh for his body, the church's sake. He said, I'm a minister for him. And then here's where I want you to really focus. Here's that mystery. Here's that previously unknown truth, and it's all about Jesus. He says in verse 26, I'm a, I'm a minister. Uh, I'm making known to you the word of God, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations. It's been hid for centuries and from generations of people. They didn't know this until God used Paul to reveal. What is it? It must be important. After all this time, God reveals it through Paul. Well, what is it? It's only made manifest. It's only revealed to believers. Here it is, verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations, among the Gentiles. Here it is. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Remember I said that the emphasis of the book of Colossians is not that you are in Christ, but rather that Christ is in you. And here it is clearly stated in that 27th verse. So let's make, again, the identification of Messiah Jesus. Not only is he the Savior and the Sovereign, but he is the secret. Here He is the secret. That is, we have a tremendous revelation here, and that is that Messiah Jesus who lived in a perfect, sinless human body on this earth for 33 years, now lives in your human body. Now lives in your human body. So how can the body be evil? He now lives in your human body, and he does so via 
the Holy Spirit, right? Through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ inhabits the, the human spirit that is in our human body. And so through the Spirit, he lives in us. Christ is in you. And that is the answer to all evil that the physical body can ever think of or do. Christ in you. It's the only way to conquer the evil that exists in us. Yes, our human body sins. It's the vehicle. It's the instrument through which we sin. We sin through our body's mind. We sin through our body's mouth. We sin through our body's parts. And here's the only answer to conquering the evil that would come out through a human body. Christ in you. Christ in you. That's your hope. That's your hope of glory now and forever. Christ in you. So that's the identification. That's all chapter one. Chapter two is what I call interpretation. Here's what I mean by that. What does it mean for the believer to live life in a human body? If Christ is in me, what does that mean for a human being to live the Christian life in a human body? Well, go with me to down to verse 4. He says in that fourth verse, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. He is talking about the heresy of Gnosticism here, okay? He, he uses uh, another phrase in verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you, ruin you through philosophy and vain deceit, okay? That's what he's talking about. And in verse 5, he says, Though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying, beholding your order, your steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now look at verse 6, because here's what it means to live a Christian life in a human body. Verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Walk ye in him. What is he saying? The same way that you depended upon Jesus to save you from sin initially is the way that you live your life continually by a God dependence to produce the fruit of the Spirit via the Holy Spirit in your body, through your body, by faith. Faith is the key. It accesses the saving power of God, and it continues to access the sanctifying power of God in the life. It's God dependence. The same way you're saved is the way you live. And if you're saved by grace, if you're saved by unmerited favor, then you can't unmerit it, right? You can't lose it because you didn't earn it to begin with. How can you lose what you didn't earn? So it's faith all the way around. But here's another thing that's important to understand about the interpretation of what it means for living the Christian life in a human body. Drop down to verses 9 and 10. For in him, that's Jesus, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That kind of reminds me of what we already saw there in verse 19 of chapter 1. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. It's repeated there in that uh, ninth verse of chapter 2. And But look at verse 10. And because of that, because you're joined to him, because Christ is in you, you are complete in him, which is the head of all unseen realm, principality, and power. So here's what it means to live the Christian life, not only faith, but fullness. Jesus is fully God in a human body, and as such, when he comes to dwell in your human body, remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When he comes to dwell in your human body, guess what? 
He brings God's original intended completeness to your human body. That is God within you. You're connected. You're joined to the Lord. And then a third thing I wanted to share in this second chapter as we talk about what it means to live the Christian life in a human body. In verse 11, actually down to uh, verse 20, it's all about, it's a contrast between the rules, the rituals, the, 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 the rigid discipline that uh, was being um, required by these Gnostics in their heresy versus the freedom that we have in Christ. And so the third thing, to live the Christian life in a human body requires faith, it brings fullness, and it also brings freedom. All the religious rules and rituals and restrictions are ineffective against evil. And guess what? Because Christ is in you, those things are even moot because he lives his life through you as you depend upon him to do so. It's not you living it. It's not you keeping the rules. It's not you practicing asceticism and denying yourself certain things. It's Jesus living his life in and through you. Look at the contrast. He says in verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In other words, it's not a physical, it's a spiritual circumcision. In putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, you being dead in sin, and uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together, made alive with him, forgiving all your trespasses, blotting out all the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary, took it all out of the way by nailing it to his cross, and he completely destroyed the spiritual unseen powers as well. What's he talking about here? He's just saying, you don't need all these rules. You don't need these things that they're telling you they're not even real. Look at what he says in verse 17. The observance, he, I think in verse 16, he's talking about Jewish legalism that was part of it, about not eating kosher. They judge you in your food and your drink and uh, observing their, their calendar, Jewish holidays and the Sabbath. He said these things, verse 17, are just a, a shadow. They're just a shadow. They're not reality. They're, they're a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Christ is the reality. So he says in verse 18, don't let these people fool you. Don't let them trick you, beguile you of your reward by this, hum, this false humility. And uh, the, it involved, again, the worshiping of these, these powerful spiritual beings that were emanations of, from God, because remember, God can't get close to people, so they worship these emanations, these spirit beings, worshiping angels is what it says there in verse 18. Don't fall into that. Don't fall into that because Christ is in you, and that's freedom from all of this kind of bondage, okay? And then chapter 3 and 4, again, we're just doing an overview of the book of Colossians. Chapter 3 and 4 is really instruction. What I mean by that is chapters 3 and 4 tells us how can all this be lived out in daily practical Christian living? How can it all be lived? How can I make this work in my life today? That's what chapters 3 and 4 are all about. Look at the first four verses of chapter 3 and we get the first hint. How do I live this? <laughs> Christ in me? Okay, that's wonderful truth. But what does that do for me today? If you be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. 
for ye are dead. That is, you're dead to this life, to the old life. And your life, your real life, is hid with Christ in God. Because remember, Christ is in you. You're in Christ, right? And when Christ, who is our life, there you go, your life is not this world. Christ is your life. He is the Christian life. Christ is the Christian life. Christ is in you, and he is the Christian life in you. you got to depend upon him to be that. But what he says here in these first four verses really have to do with your attitude. Okay, so how can all of this be lived out in practice in daily Christian living? Number one, it has to do with your attitude. What do I mean by that? Well, he says it in the first two verses. He says, you got to have a particular mindset. You have to think a certain way. Remember uh, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. You got to have Jesus thinking. You got to think like Jesus thinks. And he's in you so you can do that. Because Christ is in you, he can, he can think through you. And here's the kind of focus you need. It's got to be an upward focus. Things above. It's got to be a heavenly focus. It's got to be a Christ-centered focus where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Because as he says in verse 3 and 4, you died. You died to this mere earthly life. And your real life is hidden away with Christ in God, he tells us. And so as a result, an attitude, a mindset, a focus, a particular kind of thinking is very key to practical living of Christ in you. There's a second thing in verses 5 to 17. I don't have time to read all these verses. But really, in verses 5 to 17, it's about casting off basically the old life and keying in to the new life of Christ in you. And he names a whole bunch of things that we used to do, uh, but we should put off, like verse 8, anger, wrath, malice, but there's a whole list there. But I can take verses 5 to 17 of chapter 3, and I can sum it up with one word, abiding, abiding. What we are called to do, and this is how it becomes practical in your daily life to live the Christian life. What we're called to do in these verses is what Jesus called abide in me is what Jesus called, I've come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. This is abiding. This is abundant life that he's talking about. It's letting Jesus live his life through you by you depending upon Christ in you. It's the same truth. I have been crucified with Christ. That's what he said in verse 3 of chapter 3. You're dead. I've been crucified with Christ. But Paul then says, nevertheless, I live. I'm dead, but I'm alive? Yeah. I am dead to my old life because the old man was crucified with Christ. That's the old person. That's the old life that I lived before salvation. That's dead and buried. Okay? Now he says, let Jesus live this new life, his resurrection life. Let him live his resurrection life through you as you depend upon him moment by moment to do so because he's in. So I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. I don't I live, but it's really not me living. It's Christ living his life through me. Galatians 2.20, that's what he's teaching there. It's, in different words, what Paul meant 
when in Philippians chapter two and verse 13, he had just said, hey, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. He said, for it is God that worketh in you both to will, that is to give you a desire, and to do, that is to give you the ability to carry out the desire that he gives his own good pleasure. Or what Paul meant in Philippians 4.13 when he said uh, he was talking about how he had learned to be content with the whatsoever's in his life. And he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do it not because I made up my mind and I'm strong, but I can do it because though I am weak and I am incapable of of accomplishing it, if I depend upon Christ in me, he is constantly infusing his life and the power and strength of it into me. So I'm depending on him. This is... This is instruction here. This is how you live this life on a practical daily basis. There's one final thing, and this picks up, I think, in verse 18 of chapter 3 and runs through the rest of the chapter, at least down to uh, verse 6, and that is this. He says, wives, Submit yourselves to your own husbands as it's fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters. Uh, Masters, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. Um, Verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same, praying for us. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them which are, are without, that's unbelievers, redeeming the time. Let your speech, verse 6, chapter 4, be always with grace, seasoned with salt. You might know how to answer. Here's the third way that you practically live this Christian life. Not only attitude, not only abiding, but in associations. In all human relationships, they're all covered there. Whether the human relationship is a voluntary one you enter into or a forced one, a slave and a master relationship, whether it is a domestic relationship in the home or otherwise, whether it is with people, the, the, the relationship, or with God, devote yourself to prayer, he says in that second verse. Whether, uh, whatever it is, you live those relationships out of the fullness of Christ in you. You live your relationships out of the fullness of Christ in you. And boy, that transforms your relationships. It really does. You draw from Christ's loving heart in all your situations, in your home, on your job, in your devotional life, as you witness, and Jesus is more sufficient for every day, for everything for you. Years ago, I remember reading about a wealthy man who purchased a Rolls Royce, and he loved the car's craftsmanship, and he was impressed by the attention to luxurious details that he found in that vehicle. But he was especially amazed by the tremendous amount of power under the hood. And he always wondered, how much horsepower does this engine produce? So he, like, studied the the vehicle manual. And uh, he wanted to learn as much as possible about this automobile. But he was never able to find any reference to the number of horsepower that the engine produced. And so he finally decided that he was going to contact the company that made the vehicle and inquire. So he did. He wrote a letter. And sometime later, he got uh, a response, and he was anxious. He opened the reply from Rolls-Royce, and when he opened it, to his surprise, (laughs) uh, on that whole piece of, uh, of paper for a letter, 
There is just one word in answer to his question about the vehicle's horsepower. It simply read, adequate. Adequate. The book of Colossians, four little chapters, all about Christ in you, the fact that Jesus indwells you to live his life in you and through you to make you adequate, to make you sufficient as a believer in all things. There's nothing that this life can throw at you. There's nothing that can come up by surprise that we don't have the adequacy, the sufficiency in Christ to handle. That doesn't mean we always take the adequacy but it's always available. The potential, you see, the potential to not sin is, is there. And that's why John says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, I have written this unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, there is even forgiveness for that, right? He's adequate. He's sufficient. This is the same thing, again, that uh, that passage in Philippians 4.13 is talking about. We mentioned this last week. When Paul says that he has learned in whatsoever state he is in to be content, the word content literally means self-sufficient. But his sufficiency was not in himself, but it means that he contained in himself all that was necessary to face any situation. And what he contained in himself that made him content was the adequacy or the sufficiency of Christ in him. And that's the key. So, in closing, I guess the first thing we need to really be honest about is this. Am I absolutely sure that Christ is in me? He's only in you if you accept him. He doesn't come in incognito. He doesn't come in without you knowing it. If, if you ask someone uh, if they are saved or born again and they're not sure, mark it down, they're not. Because it is, it's a birth. And, uh, you know, people know when you're born. We have things such as birthdays. Yeah. And even if you don't know when your birthday is, you still know you're born, you're alive, right? If you are born again, you know it. My point is that. And so I want to ask you, is Christ in you? Are you born again? I'm not asking you if you think you're a Christian. I'm not asking you if you know about God. I'm not asking you even if you read your Bible. Or come to church. I'm asking you, is Christ in you? Because if he isn't, you don't have his life. And if you don't have his life, then you're headed not only for a physical, but a spiritual and what the Bible calls an, a second death, which is an eternal death, in what is the lake of fire. So is Christ in you? And if he isn't, he can be in you today. But it's a choice that you have to personally make. Again, he doesn't come in sneaky. He comes in straightforward by you inviting him in. And if, if he's waiting, he's waiting to come into your life. And all you have to do is invite him in. And you do that by recognizing that you're lost and there's no hope for you apart from Jesus saving you from sin. And you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I'm perishing. I want you to come in. I want Christ in me, like the Bible talks about. And he'll save you. He'll forgive you. And he'll stay in you and never leave you. That's what he says. He'll never leave you. So, is Christ in you? If he's in you, what difference is that making in your life? I mean, come on, be honest. What difference is that making in your life? Can people tell that Christ is in you? They should be able to see. There's something different about that individual. They may not like what, what's different about you. They may or they may not, but they should know that there's something different about you, and it's Christ in you that makes that difference. So 
How about it with you? What difference does Christ in you make in your life? What difference does it make in your home? Does that make you a better child to father and mother? To your father? Yes, it does. It impacts the way that you interact with your, your, your brothers and your sisters and your father and your mother. Does that make you a better spouse and a better parent? Yes, it does. Christ in you, remember, it covers all relationships. And you have to depend upon him for all these relationships that we have. The most important thing in life is your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. You want them to count? Christ in you. Let him live his life in and through you. And you will, you'll make your, make your family happy if they're believers. You'll make them very happy. They'll be very pleased in the difference that Christ makes in your life.